you know that Earth and its land masses have not always looked the same as they do today? Did you know that even though you are sitting still, you are still moving really, really slowly? Today we are going to talk about the changing surface of the Earth and focus on what the surface of the Earth will look like in the future. What will the surface of the Earth look like in the future? We broke this down into three researchable, testable questions. How will the tectonic plates eventually position the Earth's land masses? How are the shifting of the tectonic plates affecting the size of the Earth? How has the movement of plate tectonics affected the physical appearance of Earth in reference to its terrain? How will the tectonic plates eventually position the Earth's land masses? Throughout history, there have been many geologic visionaries. We have encountered but a few of them in our tour of plate tectonics. A Yugoslavian seismologist was studying small earthquakes in 1909 when he discovered that seismic waves from nearby earthquakes traveled slower than waves of distant earthquakes. In 1912, Alfred Wegener proposed the continental drift theory. Harry Hess and Robert Dids believed if new oceanic crust w were created, then elsewhere it must be destroyed in their seafloor spreading hypothesis of 1962. Many of the other scientists contributed to the discovery of magnetic stripping, varying sediment thickness, and age dating on the ocean floor. It is only taken together in one grand theory that these individual theories and discoveries provide a unifying framework that enables us to explain rifting of continents to create oceans, the collision of continents to form mountains, and the occurrence of earthquakes and volcanoes along plate boundaries, to name a few. In 1912, Alfred Wagner introduced the first scientific theory stating that the continents are not fixed, but rather they moved to their current locations over hundreds of millions of years and are still moving. He supported his continental drift theory with several lines of evidence, including the distribution of similar fossils and geologic formations across many continents. Still another line of evidence was the apparent puzzle-like fit of the South American and African coastlines. The first seed in the theory of plate tectonics actually started in the early 1900s, well before the pattern of earthquake and volcano distributions was noted. Instead, a small group of early scientists was captivated by the complementary shape of the continental coastlines. Alfred Wagner, a German geologist, was consumed with the idea that continents moved to their current locations over the course of millions of years. Formerly, he believed the continents had been one large landmass that he named Pangaea. Eventually, the landmasses will converge into one supercontinent. The interversion model assumes that the oceanic plate between continents that formed when a supercontinent pulled apart has stopped spreading. As such, there is nothing to keep the continents from drifting back together and forming another supercontinent. The extraversion model, on the other hand, proposes that the oceanic plate that formed when a supercontinent pulled apart would keep spreading. The continents then drift away from it, meeting up on the other side of the planet to merge. The new orthoversion model bases its motion of continents on where the edges of past supercontinents were. For instance, when Pangaea broke up, the rim dove or subducted downward into the Earth. This subduction zone, which encircles the Pacific Ocean, is known as the Ring of Fire and is where many of the largest earthquakes and volcanic eruptions now take place. The orthoversion model proposes that the subduction zone surrounding a one-time supercontinent drives where its former components end up going. This suggests that modern continents will slide either north or south around the Ring of Fire. Since the Caribbean Sea between the North and South and the Arctic Ocean between the Americas and Asia appear transient in nature. The researcher suggests the Americas and Asia will go north instead of south, meeting at the Arctic to form Amasia. To see which model of the supercontinent cycle might be right, the researchers tried to see which best matched data on how past supercontinents formed. These models show all of the possible outcomes for Earth's future, as the plates are continuously moving about 2.5 centimeters a year to about 15 centimeters a year in some places. How long will it take for the plates to form a supercontinent? How big will the supercontinent be? Will the continents fit together in the same place as they broke apart? How are the shifting of tectonic plates affecting the size of the Earth? The land masses used to be a supercontinent called Pangaea, and now they are separated with oceans between them. However, the oceans and land masses are all still the same size as they once were. The Earth is recycling its crust, therefore the size of the Earth remains the same. Harry Hess and Robert Dietz hypothesized that if new oceanic crust was created at mid-ocean ridges, it must be destroyed somewhere else. They presented their theory, known as seafloor spreading, in a paper published in 1962. The theory proposed that new crust was created by magma rising at mid-ocean ridges, and at the same time, old crust was destroyed where some oceans and continents met. The newly formed crust would slowly creep away from the ridges as if being carried by a conveyor belt. 
Meanwhile, crust that had formed millions of years earlier was descending into deep trenches known to exist along the edges of the Pacific Ocean. A new ship capable of drilling into the ocean floor transferred the Atlantic Ocean, collecting sediments and crust samples on a research mission during the year of 1968. Meanwhile, land scientists were learning new ways to determine the geologic age of rocks. Age dating techniques were applied to the recently collected ocean floor samples, revealing old crust along the edges of the ocean and young crust near the center of the ocean or along the mid-ocean ridge. The oldest known oceanic crust was about 180 million years old, whereas the oldest known continental crust is about 4 billion years old. Constant recycling keeps oceanic crust young. Neighboring plates can be pulling apart, pushing together, sliding past one another, or some combination of these motions. When two plates are pulling apart, magma rises from the mantle and forms new crust. Meanwhile, old crust is destroyed in sub subduction zones where two plates are pushing together and one sinks beneath the other. Sometimes neither plate sinks when plates push together and large mountains are formed such as the Himalayas. Plates sliding past one another can get stuck, build up stress, and release that stress in the form of earthquakes. We know the size of the earth has not changed over millions of years. Thus, a new crust is created, old crust is destroyed. As one ocean grows, quite likely another shrinks. North America and Europe creep slowly apart as the Atlantic Ocean grows at a rate of about 2.5 centimeters a year. If oceanic crust is constantly being formed at mid-ocean ridge and destroyed where some oceans meet continents, how do you think the age of oceanic crust compares with that of continental crust? How long does it take each the continental and the mid-ocean ridge to recycle? How has the movement of plate tectonics affected the appearance of Earth in the reference to its terrain? How can we use this to predict the effects in the future? The formations present throughout the planet are a result of shifting tectonic plates. These formations have allowed us to study their movement. Plate tectonics pushing, pulling, and sliding past each other have caused mountain ranges and deep ocean trenches. We've measured the route and speed of the tectonic plates. Therefore, we can infer they will continue this pattern. The Andes Mountains in South America are the world's second highest mountain chain. These mountains form due to the subduction of the Nazca Plate under the South American Plate along the Peru-Chile Trench. A long, deep trench is formed at the boundary between two plates. One such trench is the Peru-Chile Trench, where the Nazca Plate is pushing toward and being subducted under the South American Plate along the western coast of South America. The compressive force of two plates pushing toward each other causes some crumpling of the edges of the plates, like when two cars collide. In addition, sediments from the surface of the ocean floor are scraped off as the plate descends and slowly build up over time. The rising blobs of magma erupt as volcanoes, which builds up mountains over time. Those rising blobs of magma oh, heat no. up plates is also associated with some of the great mountain chains of the Earth, including the towering Andes Mountains in South America. Several different forces associated with the boundary work together to build mountains, the area around them, and cause the plate to rise a little, just as the hot magma at a mid-oceanic ridge causes it to rise a little. Working together over very long periods of time, these forces gradually build up mountains. Mountain chains formed by subduction at a convergent boundary are referred to as a volcanic arc. A long, deep trench is formed where one oceanic plate is subducted beneath another oceanic plate. They are the same type of lithosphere, unlike the subduction of a dense oceanic plate beneath a less dense continental plate. Additionally, the density of oceanic plates varies. Oceanic lithosphere is hot when it is newly formed, and as it gradually cools, it becomes denser. It also sinks. Therefore, older oceanic crust is denser than younger oceanic crust. When two oceanic plates converge, the older, denser plate is subducted beneath the younger, less dense plate, just as an oceanic continental convergence. Do we have the technology to tell when and where the next mountain range or deep trench will take place? How do some mountain ranges and or deep trenches become much larger than the others? How many more trenches and mountain ranges will we have in the future? To review, with the information we know in the continental drift theory, coupled with the data from plates moving, we can infer that the plates will combine to form a supercontinent again in the future. The material that makes up the crust is consistently recycled, meaning the Earth will stay the same size. As long as the plates continue to shift, terrain will continue to change.